Hello everyone, uh, my name is David Gero, I'm a lecturer at University of Surrey in the UK and uh, this is a presentation of a paper accepted at Financial Crypto 2021 called Terrorist Fraud in Distance Bonding, Getting Around the Models. So the problem that we are looking at is the problem of illegal delegation of authentication. So here we have an authentication protocol where we have a prover, Bob, knowing a secret key X. We have um, a verifier, Victor, knowing the secret key X as well. And we have an accomplice of Bob called Alice. And here um, the verifier guards a door, which could be uh, either the access to a building, or it could be, uh, for instance, if Victor is a payment terminal, uh, it could be uh, accepting a payment or denying it, verifying that the card is valid. And uh, here, the idea of illegal delegation of authentication is that Alice would impersonate uh, Bob to Victor with the help of Bob. So Alice would receive a challenge from Victor uh, to prove that she knows the secret key X. And she would simply forward this challenge to Bob, receive uh, uh, his response, and then answer to Victor and uh, pass the protocol. In this talk, we will focus on distance bonding protocols proposed by Brent and Shome in 1993 to counter relay attacks by introducing some timing in the exchanges. So here we have an, archi an architecture that is common to a lot of protocols um, and it goes as follows. So you have the verifier Victor sending a nonce NV to Bob, Bob replying with a nonce NP, and then both of them compute the output of a PRF, a pseudo random function, keyed with X on the two nonces. And uh, this output is stored in a bit vector A. And then for n rounds, we have the verifier Victor sending a challenge, a uh, one bit challenge CI, and expecting a, rep a response depending on the secret key and on the challenge value. So uh, for instance, AI, the ith bit of A, XOR CI. And this exchange is timed in such a way that Victor can compute an upper bound on the distance of Bob and uh, this way prevent relay attacks. The particular threat we are looking at in this paper is called terrorist fraud. And it's a case where Bob helps an accomplice Alice authenticate to Victor. And in general, it goes this way. So you have Victor sending envy, Alice uh, sending envy to Bob and asking for help and receiving some help. So for instance, uh, the vector A as well as the nonce NP. Then Alice can forward NP to Victor and then for all the challenges, uh, because Alice knows A, she can reply um, with the correct response, AI XOR CI. Uh, remember that A is a PRF uh, keyed with X and NP and NV. How can we prevent this? Well, in distance bonding, we make this assumption that Bob does not want Alice to impersonate him in later sessions. And that's because otherwise there is a trivial attack that we can't do anything about. So we generally assume in terms of terrorist fraud that Bob knows his key, and if he knows his key, he can simply give it to Alice. And then if he does that, Alice can authenticate and we can't do anything. So we make the assumption that Bob wants to protect his authentication right and not permit Alice to authenticate on his behalf later. And this is implemented by modifying the response function. So here, as you can see, we have AI XOR CI XI, which is one bit of A if the challenge is zero, and this bit of A XOR the corresponding bit of the key otherwise. And the idea here is that if Bob gives both response vectors to his accomplice Alice, then by XORing them, Alice recovers the key. And there are two main schools of thought regarding uh, terrorist fraud resistance. We have the model uh, by Fischlin and Onete, uh, which we call FO, where they say that the protocol is resistant, is terrorist fraud resistant, if for all Alice and Bob, X leaks after one session if Alice uh, is helped by Bob. Right? So basically, if Bob helps Alice once, then he is forced to give his secret key. And on the other hand, we have the BMV model in which in some definitions, we have that uh, the protocol is resistant if for all Alice and Bob, X leaks after K sessions, where K is not necessarily one. So basically we have that BMV covers more attacks because uh, it allows for more freedom uh, for Alice. What we propose in this paper is a strategy for terrorist fraud that defeats existing countermeasures 
and that uses a novel approach. So in this attack, we use what we call directional antennas through which the prover Bob can send messages such that only Victor can receive the message and only Victor can know that there was a message sent. So in practice, uh, it would imply that Alice is not on the line of sight between Bob and Victor and that uh, Bob uh, can send his messages in such a way that Alice does not see them. And uh, the idea of using directional antennas for terrorist fraud is not completely new. And it was proposed by uh, Amadi and co-authors uh, in a paper uh, not so long ago, where they proposed similar attacks against anonymous distance bounding protocols, so a specific class of distance bounding protocols, and they are focused on uh, the initial message exchanges, whereas we focus on, uh, on the, the timed um, exchanges. And uh, this way we can cover way more protocols and, uh, and propose a new strategy. So it goes as follows. Uh, we have Bob giving some help, H, to Alice. And uh, we have two, uh, we divide the rounds in two sets. We have a set S, for which Bob will send his own response through the directional antenna in such a way that it overwrites Alice's responses. And uh, for the rest of the rounds, Alice will send a response and that's the response that will be accepted by Victor. So here the key point is how to define uh, this help vector and this set S. The design of the help vector H in this attack is particularly important. So let's look at it. Uh, first, the first point to note is that the rounds in S, where Bob will reply on his own, are the rounds such that Xi is equal to zero. And if you look at the response function, you will understand why. It's because for these rounds, we would have the response being AI regardless of the value of the challenge because um, XI equals zero would cancel the challenge. And in that case, Bob can send his response in advance and he knows that uh, he will be correct even if he does not know the challenge yet. Then um, the other criteria that we have is that Alice must be able to respond for the rounds that are not in S. So she needs to have the, the responses in some way. And she must not be able to learn X from the help vector H, because otherwise our attack is not valid. So the first choice would be to give both correct responses to Alice for the rounds that are not in S, so the rounds where she will be in charge of responding, and nothing for the rest of the rounds. And this uh, strategy, we classify it as borderline, and I will come back to this later. Another strategy would be to give both correct responses to Alice for the rounds that are not in S, and to give her AI and AI XOR some random string for uh, the rounds that are in S. Um, and in this case, the problem is that we still leak 75% of the key bits because uh, if Alice XORs the two response vectors uh, that, she, that she has, well, for the rounds that are not in S, she will recover the correct key bits. And for the other ones, she will recover the correct key bit with probability one half. So it means that in total, she gets uh, on average 75% of the key, which is a problem. So our solution that we go with is to give Alice AI and AI XOR1, so the complement of AI, for all rounds. And that way, Alice only learns AI or A, the vector A, which is the PRF keyed with X of NP and NV, which Basically, we assume gives nothing uh, about the key. In practice, it goes as follows. In the beginning, we have our nonce exchange as usual, either directly between Bob and Victor or through Alice. And we have Bob sending A to Alice and instructing her to reply with AI if the challenge is zero and AI XOR one if the challenge is one for all rounds. And because you will only let Alice reply for the rounds uh, where xi, the key bit uh, at position i is 1, it means that her response will always be correct uh, for the rounds where Bob will not answer himself. But for some of the rounds where xi is equal to 0, Bob will send his own response overwriting Alice's response through a directional antenna. And uh, this response will be AI. As we saw before, that will be a valid response for, for these rounds. And here I want to underline that it's crucial that Alice is not able to see that Bob sent a message because otherwise she can uh, conclude things about the strategy used and potentially recover the key.
while designing the help vector H, we came along some interesting findings, and I'm going to share them with you. So the first one is that uh, the first case, uh, I said it was borderline. So the first case, remember, was giving uh, the two correct responses for all the rounds that are not in S and nothing otherwise. And here, the interesting questions that, pop, that pops up uh, is, does Alice know the strategy? It's something that we never think about. But if she knows the strategy, then by simply observing what she has, she knows that she has the responses that are uh, for rounds that are not in S, which means that the key bit must be 1. And she also knows that for the other rounds, the key bit must be 0. So if she knows the strategy, she recovers the key directly. And furthermore, can she guess the strategy? Because here what she has is in practice AI and AI XOR 1 for half the rounds. So the only strategy that really makes sense that Bob could be following is, is the one that we just described, right? And so by making some um, some additional reasoning, even though in the strict uh, sense she only knows half the key bits, the ones corresponding to the responses that were given to her, she can recover the whole secret. And that's something that is uh, quite interesting to look at. Then if we look at the second strategy, where uh, we have Alice being able to recover 75% of the key bits, here, the problem is that for some protocols, in particular protocols uh, proven secure in the FO model, we have uh, what is called the backdoor, which is a mechanism in which if you have a given number of key bits, so for instance, 75% of key bits, you can call a mechanism through the, the protocol that allows you to authenticate even if you don't know the whole secret. And uh, that's a mechanism that is used for provable terrorist fraud resistance. And so in that case, giving away 75% of the key bits might, uh, might fall short to these backdoors and render our attack invalid. And finally, with the strategy that we chose, we have an interesting point. So in BMV, we don't look only at one help, but uh, at uh, Bob helping Alice k times, and here, we can observe that there is actually an attack in that case, that Alice can recover the secret key. How can she do that? Well, if she refuses to send a response for one given round and observes the outcome of the authentication, she can deduce the corresponding key bits. That's assuming that she knows what strategy is used. Because if she did not send the response and Bob did not send one as well, so it means that the round was not in S, then the authentication will be rejected because no one uh, answered at a given round. And if she doesn't give a response but the authentication is still accepted, then uh, she can know that Bob sent a response and that by consequence it means that the round was in S and she can deduce the key bit as well. And that's something that has not been studied before. We generally assume that there is a given strategy and that Alice follows it and that she does not try to cheat on that strategy because Generally, that would not permit her to learn anything more. But here we have an interesting example where we actually uh, can learn more information by cheating and uh, not following the exact instructions given by Bob. So here are a few vulner vulnerable and safe protocols. So the vulnerable protocols are basically most, most terrorist fraud resistant protocols or protocols attempting to be terrorist fraud resistant are vulnerable to this attack. And uh, a few notable examples are uh, FO, Itomi, Swiss Nice, some variants of uh, Ski and DBOpt. And what's interesting is that in this list, uh, FO and Ski and DBOpt were proven secure in their respective formalism. And regardless, uh, this attack completely goes around the model uh, through the directional antennas and uh, enables new attacks. And uh, then the secure protocols, uh, and that, that was quite interesting to find out. Uh, there are some protocols where there are T challenge response values instead of, uh, of just binary challenge responses. And here, the idea is that S becomes smarter, so uh, becomes smaller. The, the number of rounds for which all responses are equal becomes smaller because there are more responses. And uh, in that case, we have uh, protocols such as uh, Ski and DBOpt for some versions that uh, that have more than uh, more than binary challenges, and we have the TDB protocol. Then we have protocols that have randomized 
timings and that's um, that's something that I find quite interesting as well. Uh, we have dbopt rend and dbopt sync rend where the time to send the challenges is randomized. And basically what that means in terms of our attack is that Bob does not know when to send his response in advance and therefore he can't apply our strategy. And finally, we have protocols that are non-PRF based or protocols where uh, the responses are not sent bit by bit, but by block. And one example of that is PuffDB. And because in that case, uh, we can't do all the, all the decomposition into rounds because everything has to be sent at once and it becomes more complicated. And uh, the key takeaway is that this attack is mainly theoretical. Probably not uh, applicable in practice at the moment, uh, definitely not on contactless payment, for instance, but uh, it, uh, it highlights some very interesting theoretical points. Uh, and that's why I, I like it so much. And, uh, in the paper, we also present another generic attack, which is something that is very, very basic, but uh, that to me uh, questions the very notion of terrorist fraud resistance. And here the idea is that Bob, instead of giving some help vector to Alice, uh, gives Alice a tamper-proof clone of his device, so his card or his smartphone or, or whatever. So some form of token that is tamper-proof and embeds uh, Bob's secret key. And then Alice just uses this to authenticate. Uh, and of course, uh, then if we do just that, Alice can impersonate Bob later, so... Um, so that would not be uh, that, that would not be a valid terrorist fraud. But then what we can do is consider the tamper proof clone as a one-time function. And in practice, that would be uh, setting an instruction inside this clone that says that after one authentication or after a k authentication, uh, basically the memory is erased or the device self destructs and uh, anything you can think of. And this attack basically works on all protocols and there, there is not much that we can do about it, uh, except making sure that Bob does not know his secret key in the first place so that he cannot create such a device. And uh, th that's something that uh, that we should really keep in mind when we do research on terrorist fraud resistance. We tend to ignore very basic attacks because uh, it's convenient and we can't do anything if we consider these attacks, but th that's something that we should keep in mind. Uh, yeah, of course, a variant of that is that uh, Bob gives this card to Alice for her to go buy something inside the store and waits for Alice with a baseball bat at the exit of the store so that he can get his card back, right? Uh, that's, that's something that we can't do much about and, uh, and this way Bob retains his card and, and still uh, performs a terrorist fraud. To conclude this talk, let's go through the main points of the paper. So we show a new generic attack using directional antennas that can break the terrorist fraud resistance of most protocols. And uh, this leads to new reflections on what Alice can do, and in particular whether she can infer Bob's strategy and what happens in this case, and if she can deviate from Bob's instructions and what she can gain in this case, because here we, we find that she can actually gain something, and that's something that uh, was not looked at before. And finally, we presented an attack using uh, cloned devices, which basically uh, destroyed all uh, terrorist fraud resistance that we can try to implement. Uh, and that's something we can hardly do anything against. Uh, except by making sure that Bob does not know his secret key. So for instance, only giving him temper-proof devices, such as uh, a card that is secure, because if Bob knows his key, then he can uh, always do that, and, and there is nothing we can do about it. So that was it. Thank you so much for your attention, and uh, I will answer your questions uh, during the conference if, uh, if you have any.